This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. This week's Changemaker is Maurice Jones, the CEO and president of the local initiative support corporation, LISC. And LISC is the largest community development organization in the country. They provide access to capital, grants, and loans, plus affordable housing and technical assistance to places such as schools, healthcare centers, and organized groups. Maurice, thank you for joining me today. Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. A little bit about your background before we get started. Tell us about your degrees. That You have a political science degree, and you went on to get your uh, several other degrees, and you were even a Rhodes Scholar. Tell us a little bit about that and how that progression has brought you to where you are today. Sure. Well, I've been uh, very, very fortunate in that regard in that I was able to do a BA degree, I uh, got really lucky and um, went over to Oxford following my BA degree and did a um, what they call an MPhil degree, but was on a Rhodes Scholarship. And so it was a terrific transformative experience for me to be in a different country, uh, studying with people from all over the world and um, with the ability from time to time to actually do some traveling when we weren't in school, uh, it changed my life. It made me more of a citizen of the world than I had been uh, before that three years. And then I returned back to the States. Uh, I had always aspired to go to law school, so I went to law school after that. And um, my grandfather would say, uh, <laughs> he used to say at least, God rest his soul. He used to say, uh, "Your only thing you're going to be able to do when you finish school is collect Social Security. Get out there and go to work." So I'm I'm delighted that uh, I uh, was able to um, have those uh, educational experiences. But I'm also delighted that now I'm trying to put them uh, to work, um, uh, namely uh, in this area of uh, attempting to help underserved places, underinvested places, disinvested places, and the people who live, work, and raise families in them uh, achieve some kind of sustainable economic move. That's the job that uh, we at LISC are attempting to do, and uh, it is an unfinished uh, project, that's for sure. You know, it probably drives a lot of your passion as you within an organization are trying to advocate for, you know, advancement for a variety of people like you've mentioned, but schools, you know, housing, healthcare, um, being some of those major, you know, foundations for people. So your progression, you know, within your own journey has probably, you know, it gives you even all the more motivation when you're out um, talking about the importance of these So LISC, like I mentioned, is one of the country's largest organizations supporting projects that help revitalize communities. What was the spark that got you interested in community and economic development? Well, honestly, the spark would start back at home. You know, I was raised by grandparents in a rural area. Um, Our town was 1,200 people. My grandfather went to school for six years in a barn and then went out and went to work. My grandmother lived closer to town, so she was able to go to the local colored high school, as they call it then, uh, and got a high school diploma. Um, But for them, uh, because they were uh, first and foremost black, because they were living in a small rural area, because they were living in a in a small town um their opportunities were narrower than they would have been well i should put it this way were narrower than a match for their talents and so they they're the most talented folks i've ever known but uh, what they lacked was opportunity and so i saw how folks in my hometown starting with my grandparents um needed, could use more investment, more help to actually become all they uh, were designed to be or born to be, if you will. And I saw that same picture played out throughout all of my work, whether it was in the federal government or state government or the private sector. Um, What I saw was an incredible 
array or distribution of talent, but not the same commensurate distribution of opportunity. And that really led me to community development and uh, economic development as two strategies, if you will, that could really try to catalyze opportunity. And that's really what, uh, what uh, I've been trying to do through this work is to partner with uh, people, partner with places, partner with organizations, with uh, private sector and public sector to catalyze opportunity for the incredible talent that we have all across this country. Some with four-year degrees, some without four-year degrees. It doesn't matter. Uh, we have unbelievable talent, and what we need to do is to find ways to marry that talent, uh, marry opportunity with that talent. And that's what really has led me to uh, my life's work is actually experiencing it, being a part of it, seeing how, frankly, how much of a challenge it is for our country. I think it's the greatest threat to the American uh, democratic experiment right now and also the greatest opportunity. That's what attracts me to trying to do this work. You know, because like you said, there's a lot of talent. Oh, everywhere. What happens when the talent is not realized for lack of opportunity? Because it's not that it's not realized for lack of effort in a lot of cases. It's that the opportunity window has not opened for a variety of people. That's what's so unique about what Liska is doing is there, you know, you guys are trying to shore up some of those paths or that opportunity window and provide a vehicle to allow for whatever the dream or whatever, you know, the pursuit is to become a reality. Um, and just, you know, even along that thread, uh, CNN, there was a headline that said that corporate America has uh, worked with LISC to provide about $2 billion. And what does that translate into? What are you guys, uh, what's your goal here when we talk about windows of opportunity? I mean, this is a real program path for you. So we think we're going to invest about $2 billion this year. I'll tell you, we've been around for 40 years. We've invested about $22 billion uh, all across the country. And what that translates into uh, is uh, about 400,000, in fact, about 420,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, that translates into about 73 million square feet of community facility space. And I mean, that means you know, schools, child care centers, uh, that means commercial facilities for businesses, that means health care centers for clinics, that translates into hundreds of community food access projects from supermarkets to food markets, uh, et cetera, that translates into hundreds of businesses, in fact, uh, probably now, It'll be closer to thousands of businesses being assisted with this work. So, you know, that's at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to use all of that capital to invest in economic development, in education, in housing, in facilities, in health care, in safety. We do a, a bunch of work trying to help communities, particularly communities of color and law enforcement work together to solve crime around hotspots. That's what that translates into. Now, I wish I could tell you that with this two billion this year, the work will be done, <laughs> but that's right. not the case. The bottom line in our country is we have an economy and we have structures, if you will, that this economy, this economic engine that we uh, rely on perpetuates that actually creates, perpetuates, actually catalyzes inequality. And so what we're trying to do is to use those $2 billion this year, just as we used the billions before that, to make investments in those things that are trying to close these gaps, close these gaps in wealth, close these gaps in health, close these gaps in opportunity. Not by taking wealth from anybody else, but by actually 
investing in those communities and in those places and in those people who with our partnership will be able to create and generate wealth themselves. And by the way, that is good, yes, for those people and for those places, but it's also good for the entire American experiment. I can't remember who did this, but one of the consulting firms did an analysis which showed that if we could close the wealth gap between blacks and whites in the country, that we would actually add one trillion to 1.5 trillion more dollars to the national GDP. This wow. is the great American challenge, but it's doable if we invest in it at scale. One clear area when we talk about gaps is home ownership. And I know that you've really talked openly about this, just the gaps between white home ownership and black and brown home ownership. But for people who are listening to this podcast, who aren't in the industry, who may not even recognize that there is a gap, tell us about that, but start real basic for us and tell us what the problem is and why this problem is important for us to um, solve. Well, it's huge. So if you think about the assets, if you will, in this country that can actually create intergenerational wealth, right? Wealth that you can actually translate across generations in a family or in a community. There are, you know, at least a couple key ones. Uh, one is small business ownership. The other is home ownership. Uh, and it has been a source of wealth for Americans for the entirety, honestly, of the American experiment. Well, let's look at the data today. Today, the black home ownership rate, which is a little over 40%, is the lowest that it's been in 50 years the lowest that it's been in 50 years mm. and it is 30 points lower than the white home ownership rate the white home ownership rate is a little over 70 percent so it is an unbelievable gap that's going in the wrong direction and it has enormous impact on this generation and the next because as i say it's it's one of those intergenerational assets. So we have got to reverse this trend, send it the other way. Uh, and there mm -hmm. are things that we can do. We can provide more down payment assistance, for example, for communities of color, people of color, as they attempt to get mortgages and to, to get into a mortgage that's affordable and sustainable over time. Forgivable loans housing counseling, financial literacy counseling. We know that there are tools that can actually close this home ownership gap. We don't want to lessen the home ownership uh, rate for whites. What we want to do is raise the home ownership uh, mm -hmm. rates for people of color. And so to do that, you've got to be intentional about it. You've got to use tools to invest in those communities' abilities to own their homes. And they're there, the tools are there, but we need to be focused, we need to be intentional, and we need to go big. We need to be bold about it. You will not close a 30-point gap with any small investment. It has to be significant. And so, yeah, we're trying to raise a billion dollars, for example, in something that we call Project 10X, and one big piece of it is closing this home ownership gap that we're talking about now. So this new initiative you mentioned, LISC is investing in a variety of different platforms. And you said that, I think one time that there was going to be a real clear racial lens and an eye towards scale moving beyond incremental change, but to have an exponential impact. And is that related to home ownership and small Absolutely. business? Okay. Absolutely. There are four lanes that we've divided the work into. One is this intergenerational wealth piece, and that's investing in helping people of color own homes and own businesses. So getting at this gap that we just talked mm -hmm. about. A second is the wage gap. There's a huge wage gap between whites and communities of color. So we wanna use capital to invest in businesses uh, who in return 
will be providing and sustaining livable wage jobs with benefits for people of color. The third lane for us is getting at this, uh, and I'll give you another data point, getting at this issue of access to financial services. In the country today, if you take the unbanked, meaning people without any relationship with a mainstream financial institution, and the underbanked, meaning people who are still relying on, frankly, predatory lending tools to actually um, accomplish some of their financial services jobs, in the black community, that rate is 50% of the households. So 50% of black households are unbanked or underbanked. The same percentage in the white community today is, is 20%. A big piece of this work is going to be using capital to help provide financial services, access to credit, repairing people's credit score, helping people achieve savings, investing in uh, minority-led depository institutions, banks, and credit unions whose primary market are communities of color. And then in the fourth lane is the community assets, some of which we've touched on, that you need to have working for you actively if you're going to generate wealth and health and opportunity in a community. And that's broadband access, digital literacy, yeah, the second piece is education from zero to adult-based education. The third piece is the health piece that we talked about, including access to healthy food. The fourth piece is the arts piece. Uh, arts play a big role, whether it's a theater or it's a small business in the art space. And the fifth piece is safety and justice. Those four lanes make up what we call Project 10X. We call it 10X because we want to reduce that 10 times wealth gap between white families and, and black families. We are asking partners to stay with us for 10 years because it's going to take 10 years to really do something here at scale and impact. And to the point you were just making, we need 10X thinking. It needs to be bold. It needs to be innovative. That's what Project 10X is about. You know, this is a fantastic initiative, and it's something that you can put real tangible success metrics to as well. You know, you Absolutely. see the gap, you see the structure, you guys know how to fill in the gaps, you know, and in many cases, you're not reinventing the wheel here. You know, you're saying we've got tools here, we've got programs here, we've got the ability to do it. But what I like is that you guys are bundling it all together because so often we see that just maybe one thing, you know, maybe it's counseling, you know, or maybe it's, you know, the financial counseling piece, but it's not really bundled with anything else. Or, right. you know, maybe you see, okay, here's down payment assistance, but then, you know, there's nothing that comes to supplement, you know, okay, wait a minute, you've got down payment assistance, but what interest rate are you having to pay because you're not in prime position to be, you know, like you mentioned, underbanked. So this is a an approach, this 10X, Project 10X approach, it just really bundles all the different avenues of this together. And there's so many times that people are not in a position to be able to say, I can access all of this, you know, from a complete menu of personal advancement, which translates into community advancement, which translates into that next generation of, I'm moving the dial ahead. So everybody that comes after me can as well. They can pick up in a better position than was even given to me. So this Project 10X has just such a revolutionary approach to what needs to be done. We're excited about it and uh, we want partners to join the team. Okay, hold that thought, Maurice. Coming up in the second part of my conversation with Maurice Jones, the CEO and president of the Local Initiative Support Corporation, Maurice tells us how LISC convinces corporate partners to join their cause. This year has really, really motivated folks that we haven't worked with up to now who are feeling that fierce urgency of now to actually partner with us to do this kind of work, to make a serious impact on 
America's racial justice journey. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.